Okay, my name is Cassidy Arstead. I'm a fresh graduate student at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So today I'm going to talk about the project we're working on this year, uh, an arc fault circuit interrupter. So an arc fault circuit interrupter is a special type of circuit breaker that can detect if an electrical arc is occurring and then shut off the current. It's not the same as a ground fault circuit interrupter, right? A ground fault circuit interrupter is designed to protect you should you become part of that circuit. This is designed to stop an electrical arc from sustaining. Why? Electrical arcs can occur anywhere between uh, your outlet and your device, or in the device, or between your outlet and the power source, and they can easily get hot enough to cause a fire. So due to that fire hazard, AFCIs are actually mandated in most, uh, most buildings now, uh, especially residential buildings. <coughs> um, however, uh, the AFCIs that are used are used in our houses, which run off 120 volts AC. So what about um, AFCIs for DC? That's been a much more recent uh, conversation. And it wasn't until a few years ago that the NEC requ required AFCIs to be, uh, to be used in <coughs> PV systems. And their requirement was only for PV systems that are operating at 80 volts or higher. Uh, UL put forth specifications on how to test and operating specifications that should be used when designing. However, interestingly, when they put out those specifications, there was no such device that was capable of doing that. Uh, since then, a couple have come up on to the market. Our focus, however, is to design a DC AFCI that operates at less than 80 volts, or is designed to be used in systems that operate at less than 80 volts DC. Even at less than 80 volts, electrical arcs can still uh, cause fires, even with minimal amounts of current, and especially if they're running through your wall next to insulation and, and wood. So the main application we are going to use for this AFCI is for our DC house project that we're working on at Cal Poly. So this, this project is to build a house that operates only on DC. The loads are DC, the power source is DC. At no point is there anything but DC. So our DC house, which we have a prototype built at Cal Poly, has a, a, a bunch of loads connected that are all DC based. And all of the power sources that are renewable are, are on display as well. And then they run into our energy storage batteries, and then those power our house. Um, <laughs> the, the, we have the PV panels and all the other ones, human powered ones. We even have a, a swing set, a nice swing set, that uh, when, they, when they swing, it generates power, which I thought was a, like, a great way to harvest uh, the energy of children. So <laughs> um, the one we currently have on display is a 48 volt system. Uh, we have it rated at 600 watts. The nice thing about having a DC house is uh, you can, you, built like this, you can scale it up. We can continuously connect uh, more, more sources and it'll run the house in the same manner. So uh, why DC electricity in, in these sort of applications? Uh, a lot of the renewable energy sources, especially PV, output DC power. So. Um, having to convert DC to AC to transmit along your transmission lines and then get to your house and then have your little uh, you know, iPhone charger connect, convert the AC back to DC. Every time you're converting, you're losing power. So it's not very efficient. Now, maybe the benefits here in an industrialized nation of AC, it's worth it. However, in, in uh, a developing nation where huge power grids aren't built and you're running off renewable sources that are nearby to your house, maybe on your roof, uh, the need for uh, AC is just not there. So if you can just run your house off the of direct power that's being pumped out from your power sources, that's much more efficient. So we're designing a DC house so that it can be utilized mainly in developing nations so that they don't need these uh, inefficiencies of, of, of uh, power conversion. And that way, when the nation's developing, they can develop in a sustainable manner, not uh, in an unrenewable fashion and later try to convert. Uh, yeah. Okay, so 
the DC House project started a, a few years ago, and every year we try to make the technology in the DC House more robust. So along the way, we've run into a few problems, uh, such as the standardization or lack of standardization of DC loads. Uh, in in America, all of our uh, devices know that they're going to be plugged into 120 volts AC, so they're all designed to be utilized like that. However, all of our DC uh, devices run all off of a, DC, a different DC voltage, which is why every different device you have has a different charger that's meant for that device, because it converts it to the DC voltage that it needs. So it's not standardized. However, if we're not going to use any AC, then we need to be able to plug any DC load straight into an outlet. So the solution that we came up with was to develop a smart wall plug that runs off of our 48 volt system, but then adjusts its output to whatever voltage the load is asking for. And that way, there doesn't need to be a standardization yet. This can just simply be in implemented into the house. So this year, our effort to make this system more robust is to integrate an AFCI into that smart wall plug to be able to shut off the current if an arc occurs between uh, the outlet and the load, or in the load, or between the source and the outlet. The uh, response time that's stated here, UL, that specification that they put out for the systems above 80 volts, required that an arc be shut down within two seconds of its uh, startup. So we're using that same, uh, that same time limit in our, in our design. So, to, uh, to start testing this out and figuring out a method of detecting, uh, there's a couple strategies for, for a parallel circuit arc, if the arc is occurring uh, uh, between two separate circuits, then it can actually be detected fairly easily, the same way a, a ground fault circuit inter interrupter works. If you monitor the current out and monitor the current in, if they're not the same, current must be going somewhere else. So, it's possible that an arc is occurring uh, from that circuit and pushing current somewhere else. So if that's the case, and that's fairly easy, monitor the amplitude. If they don't equal, shut off the current. If we have an arc in series with a the circuit, then that's much more difficult because the current going out of the outlet and coming back in is still going to be the same, but the arc will be there. So you can't use the amplitude of the current to detect it. So uh, our strategy then was to perhaps monitor the frequency spectrum when an arc is occurring. When we're operating in DC, there shouldn't be any frequency created. So if, it's, if during an arc there is, then perhaps we can use that knowledge to trigger a breaker. So in order to study it, we had to be able to reliably create an arc so we can measure it. So we built a few different ones. And the way uh, an arc will happen is if there's current flowing through a wire and you separate those contacts, the current will continue to try to, to, to move. So you get this this, uh, this arc happening. Or if the voltage is high enough, you don't even need the current initially. It'll just jump and start going. So the way we did it, because our voltage is less than 80, is we'd start the contacts close, get the current running, and then open it as if a, a wire had come loose, and then we'd get the arc going. Something like this, we were able to control the distance of the arc, so we measured if distance had any effect. Uh, we built another one uh, that uh, different material, different shape, in case that makes a difference. So our initial experiment, fairly simple, fairly crude, power supply, our arc generator, and then just a, a passive resistor. We measured the spectrum, uh, the frequency spectrum of the voltage across that resistor and assumed that because it's just a resistor, if we're measuring the spectrum of that, we should inherently be measuring the spectrum of the current. So did that. So these were, uh, the, the fir this is the first result. So the uh, purple here was the, the baseline. No arc was occurring. The circuit was functioning properly. Um, so this, what this means, what this baseline means is zero frequency content is created. The reason it's not at negative infinity decibels would be due to the way I have it scaled, uh, the dynamic range of the uh, uh, spectrum analyzer that we're using. So when the, when the circuit is operating as expected, baseline, which is fairly flat, which it should be. There shouldn't be a big peak somewhere because there isn't any frequency content being created. When we created an arc, we saw this, which 
has actually almost the same shape, except everything comes up, which implies that uh, an arc is creating current that has a frequency at every point, at least within this range of 0 to 100 kilohertz that we monitored. And we saw a slight uh, peak towards the bottom, which we noted to see if that was consistent. So to see if this kept going at higher frequencies, we extended the range to 0 to 1 megahertz. And it was basically the same, except it gets a little bit lower. So there's a slight downward slope. And as we kept continuing, the further out we got in higher frequency, the less amplitude the frequency was. So then the next step was to see, was it just because of the equipment that we had? Or is it like that regardless of the load, the source, or any other variables or parameters that may exist when people connect their stuff? So load, arc generator, we still measured the voltage across uh, a power resistor and then a power supply, all of which we always varied. So for example, I think the next one, we varied the distance just to see if that would make any difference. And it didn't really. Now you'll notice that there's a slight bump that's a little bit different than the one before. And that did vary sometimes, depending on the parameters that we would uh, place in or the loads that we put in, especially if they're an electronic load versus a, a passive load. It would, the shape would be a little bit different. But the thing that was always consistent, regardless of what we changed or what parameter we changed, is that it created frequency content everywhere. It jumped up, regardless of what we did. So after that, we figured, well, here we're measuring the voltage across the power resistor, which in the real world we're not going to be able to do because we wouldn't want to up, hook up a resistor uh, in series because that would waste a significant amount of power. So after going through those, we used a current transformer and ran the, we stepped it down from to about 10 to 20 milliamps, then ran that across the resistor and measured that. That way we're not so intrusive into the circuit. However, after the transformer, uh, the, the current's so low that the noise signal or the frequency content that the arc was creating was so low in amplitude that it was on the same order of magnitude as the internal noise of our analyzer. So in order to still see it, we had to run it through a gain filter of, I think we had it set at maybe 40 decibels. So after that, we did all the experiments. And here's just a few that I overlaid on top. And so again, baseline and then varying loads, varying impedances. And you'll see that the shape is a little different depending on what the load was. But again, the, the fact remains that it was creating content everywhere, regardless of what we did. So uh, these were, again, some of the things that we tested. Contact material, contact shape, different gauged wires, uh, different shapes, the arcing distance, the load type, the load impedance, and hence the, uh, the amplitude of the current going through. Voltages, change the voltages, change the power supplies. All this to try to see if anything would be different or to find out what was consistent. And the thing that was consistent was that no matter what we did, there was frequency content everywhere, at least within the range that we studied which is nice because that means if I have signals everywhere, I can process them however I'd like. So that's where we're at now. Um, the next step is to try to figure out a predictable manner of detecting it via a, a microprocessor. So one of our thoughts is that if we were to go to here, we can't use the shape as a reliable method. And sometimes then the shape actually looked identical to the baseline except it was up here. So if we knew the, where the baseline was, this would be very easy. However, we can't assume that, because if an arc occurs at the startup of our system, our, micro our microprocessor might think that that is the baseline. And so it would fail to detect any of that. So we can't use the baseline to detect it. So our, our next step is to create a filter across that. And then we can shape it however we like. So if we create a band pass filter across the, uh, the signal that we're analyzing, we can always force one section to be a baseline, regardless of whether an arc occurred at startup or not. So our baseline would be here. And then even if there's an arc, if we put a band pass filter on the signal, this would always stay at baseline, regardless of when an arc occurred. So we could always identify where a baseline is and then sample a few points, and if those don't equal, or if it doesn't appear as a flat shape like it should be, then you know that an arc is occurring. 
So that's our strategy moving forward. And once we've done that, once we've built the filter, the next step is just to get a micro, uh, microprocessor, program it to do exactly what I just described, and then integrate that into our PCB for our DC, uh, for our smart wall plug. And then, yeah, eat piece of cake. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's about it. So thank you uh, to our sponsors, the, uh, uh, the CEC, and thank uh, all of you for, for coming and listening. Any questions? Oh, I just turned off. Was there any questions? Please no. <laughs> oh, I got a quick question. Oh, okay, great. I uh, noticed that the guidelines for that ground, uh, the arc fault was two seconds, I think, was the duration. So I guess it's for fire and not really for safety purposes, but it's two seconds, I guess. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And because um, uh, even with uh, a half an amp or, or even less, an arc can occur. So it's mainly a fire prevention uh, technology. Yeah. Just want to make sure. And two seconds is actually fairly long. I don't expect us to to take up even close close to that. Uh, oh, Chris, Chris Scruton. Yeah, um, I've had some discussions with people that indicated that this arcing problem is actually a lot more significant with DC, a DC infrastructure yeah. than that's with right. AC. So with with AC. Uh, especially for a 60, a 60 hertz system, your current's dropping down to zero 120 times a second. So even if a current starts up, uh, it, it'll most likely get snuffed out immediately, unless the, the contacts are still brushing across each other. But I if the contacts were to separate, you'd maybe get a spark, but then that's, that's it, because it, it can't sustain because the current's, the current's not sustaining. And the only reason you ever see like those Jacob ladders uh, keeping the current going is because they set those things to like 7,000 volts. But with DC, it's never going down to, to, zero current, to zero amps. So it'll just keep going until either the contacts become far enough apart to where the arc can't sustain itself or because the distance is too great, or if you know that an arc is occurring and purposefully shut off the current. So yeah, it's much more prevalent in DC systems. So um, just how far are you, are you along with the construction of the DC home? Are you just, are you just doing like a breadboard, breadboard port? Just say project? that again. I'm sorry. Uh, how far along are you with the, with the DC home breadboard? I guess you're doing like a prototype, right, of the different systems and trying to put them together? Well, the smart wall plug, which, uh, out, which uh, varies the output voltage, is already complete. Okay. Uh, the DC house, we actually have a very large shed that has its power sources hooked up and lights and everything loaded like that. So everything up to the AFCI that I talked about is already completed. Okay, and so um, where did you get the DC breakers? I mean, how, do you have any um, at the breaker panel itself? Um, the DC, or the smart wall pl plug, already has a microcontroller in it that controls okay. the current going through. So it'll actually be fairly simple to integrate into that smart wall plug because I'll just have the microcontroller send a shutoff signal to that, or my microprocessor send a shutoff signal to that microcontroller. The idea is that to have each uh, smart wall plug have its own, that way if an arc occurs on that circuit, they don't shut off the power to the entire house, right? So it's built into each outlet. And, and is there a ground? Is there a ground? Uh, I, when you showed the circuit, I didn't see a ground in the... Probably not. It was a fairly crude circuit. Yes, okay. the okay. the negative of the power supply was grounded. Is it grounded? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, on the uh, existing standards that are out for the yeah hi um, for yeah. the existing standards for uh, over eighty volts. Yes. Uh, how do they detect a series arc fault? Um, as far as what I was able to find out, they use the frequency spectrum as well. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good? Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Okay.